Joining us tonight is the U.S. Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, also a member of the President's Coronavirus Task Force. And uh, Mr. Surgeon General, I would like to just say, first of all, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, these are becoming increasingly difficult times. The death toll is mounting, as are the cases. Uh, it, it, what is your best judgment right now uh, uh, as to which model we should be following uh, as to what we can expect right now? Well, well, good evening, Lou, and thanks for having me. Uh, lots happened over the last several days. The president made an emergency declaration. Uh, you heard that. Um, we put out an announcement about testing, and we're, I really feel like we've turned the corner on testing. But to answer your question, uh, we're at an inflection point right now in this country. Uh, we have numbers that are about where Italy's was about two or three weeks ago. And so we've got to make a choice. We've got to decide, do we follow the path of Italy where we see a rapid increase in cases and in deaths? Or do we follow the path of South Korea, of China, who aggressively leaned into mitigation measures and saw their numbers go down precipitously? Now they've reached their peak and are seeing fewer and fewer cases every day. And it's why the president announced this week his new 15 days to slow the spread right. initiative of coronavirus, uh, helping all of America understand that we know the playbook from looking at what China did and what uh, South Korea did. Now we need to implement it, including, as the president said today at the, uh, at the press briefing, uh, we need to uh, stop any non-essential travel. We need people to stay home from work and telework if at all possible. And we need people to uh, no longer uh, get, get together in social gatherings of more than 10 people. And those uh, steps are critical, a 15-day plan. Uh, is, that, uh, is that, in your judgment, adequate for us to create, if you will, a fire break uh, between Americans and the continued contagion uh, by this disease? Well, important for the American people to know that this is going to get worse before it gets better. What we're doing now, uh, you'll see the impact of it in, uh, in three weeks, in four weeks. But again, Italy it, uh, was two weeks ago where we are right now. So we want to lean into this. We want to, as, you, as people say, flatten the curve so that we don't mm -hmm. overwhelm our health care system and so that we put our path on a trajectory that will allow us to lower the number of deaths to lower the number of infections. And I'm confident we can do that. I'm confident we can do it because we've seen it done in other places. But important to know that this outbreak isn't going to be stopped from Washington, D.C. It's not going to be stopped from the CDC in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It's going to be stopped at the community level. And we need everyone to participate with these aggressive mitigation measures. Is, and sometimes that gets complicated. In New York City, for example, Mayor de Blasio calling for the uh, possibility of a uh, shelter-in-place order from, uh, from his office. Uh, governor Andrew Cuomo saying, I'm not considering such a thing, and I am the only one as governor who can make that happen. Your reaction to shelter-in-place and this kind of uh, division, contention, uh, and friction between a, a, a governor and a mayor? Well, I used to run a state department of health. I also, also used to work for a, a local department of health. And it's important for people to know that a lot of the authority lies at the state and local level when it comes to public health in this country. Sometimes you see this back and forth because what's right for one community is not going to be right for others. What you're going to do in Indiana, where I was state health commissioner, may be different than what you do in New York City. But that's why we put out these guidelines. Uh, the president uh, heard governors say, we want guidance. And he put out these guidelines to make sure people know what the science says they should be doing. But then also, remember, they're guidelines. They're not mandates to give people the flexibility to figure out what's best for their communities based on uh, how many people have the disease in their communities and what their culture is like, what their, what their limitations are like and what they think their communities will be willing to accept. In, uh, in this country, in business, uh, very simply, uh, in most professions, including your own, best practices are essential. We're watching China, in which, uh, in which this disease originated. Uh, suddenly, they are, it appears, uh, in control of the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the disease in their country. What have they done that is most remarkable to you, that is most effective to you, that should be replicated here? 
Well, they did something that we can replicate here. And again, uh, that's aggressive social mitigation. That's making sure you're mm -hmm. keeping people apart from one another so that if I have the uh, coronavirus, I can't spread it to you. And if you have it, you can't spread it to me. Uh, also, really leaning into protecting the most vulnerable. We know that people with underlying medical conditions mm -hmm. over the age of 60 are most at risk. But that doesn't mean if you're not in an at-risk group that uh, you're off scot-free, because we know that the other people out there are the ones who are spreading it. Right. They're the ones who are taking it into the nursing home to Nana or to Grandma. And so we want to make sure uh, the people who are out there getting the disease and spreading it stay at home. We want to make sure the people who are most at risk are protected. We're also, and the president is really leaned aggressively into this, uh, working on public-private partnerships. Because what's different right. between us and China and South Korea is that in America, a lot of our capacity, a lot of our manpower lies in the private sector. And so, as I mentioned, we're not going to solve this problem from Washington, D.C., but that doesn't mean we don't have the capability to solve this problem. We need right. to unleash and engage the private sector, as the FDA did last week when they mm -hmm. approved an emergency use authorization in under five hours to allow for high-speed testing. And now America's starting to see testing in their communities. My rural community where I grew up opened to drive through testing just this week. We have testing available in all 50 mm -hmm. states. It's not where it needs to be. It's not where it should be. But it's rapidly getting there, and that's because of the private sector. Uh, it is because of the private sector, but that is the same private sector that also has outsourced and offshored the production of uh, ingredients for our pharmaceuticals, uh, for antibiotics, our dependency on, as you well know, uh, India and China, principally China, uh, for those essential uh, drugs, those essential uh, elements of, uh, of medical equipment for this country and supplies, uh, we're, in, we're in a heck of a mess. And right now there is not a short-term solution to deal with it, is there? Well, uh, there actually is. And you know this better than I do because you live in this world. There's supply and there's demand. And on the demand side, the best way to make sure you don't run out of equipment is to make sure you don't need so much equipment. And that's why the next 15 days are critical to slow mm -hmm. the spread of coronavirus right. in this country. But we're also leaning into, into the supply side. The president and the vice president have met day after day right. with private industry to increase capacity, make sure it's getting to local <laughs> communities, and also to increase the national strategic stockpile, which is designed as a backstop for communities that run out and yeah. need emergency supplies. Well, obviously, that stockpile is inadequate to, to the current needs. Uh, and when we talk about ventilators, when we talk about respirators, masks, uh, we are coming up woefully short. The military will be offering up uh, to HHS some 5 million masks, but that's not even close to the number that will be required in short order. Uh, ventilators will be in uh, short supply. And we still do not know what the, uh, the steps that are being taken by the private sector. And, and I applaud the president uh, and the entire uh, administration for a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, but I'm uncertain right now about uh, critical gaps uh, that exist in absolutely essential uh, medical equipment uh, and supplies. Well, we, we're working with the Department of Defense to, uh, to get additional supplies. Mm -hmm. We're also, again, looking right. at a bill that's coming through Congress that will increase the number of N95 masks available, for instance, by mm -hmm. 30 million masks every month. So we're looking at the supply mm -hmm. side. But again, the best way to make sure you don't run out of ventilators is to make sure so many people don't need to them. To make sure you don't need them. I, I, exactly. I got it. Uh, it's an interesting algorithm that you've, uh, you've well, got Well, it's going to take both. I, it's going to take both. I agree. And we need the American people to be realistic about the situation that we're in yeah. and understand now's the time to stop going to bars, stop going to restaurants, mm -hmm. stay at home, hunker down for two weeks, and really help us lower this demand so that we can get over what is a terrible flu season we're going through. We can empty out some of these hospital beds, and we can have room to take care of people without overwhelming our health care capacity, really flattening the curve. Indeed. Dr. Jerome Adams, Surgeon General, we thank you for being with us. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Lou. Send people to coronavirus.gov for more information on how to stay safe. Coronavirus.gov. Guaranteed. Thank you very much.